In 1920, a young graduate of the Clifton, New Jersey High School arrived at Princeton. Hubert Allier was an enthusiastic student with a special love for chemistry. Despite a year's interruption to recover from an attack of polio, he was elected to Phi Beta Kappa in his junior year and graduated with highest honors in 1925. Later, he received his PhD from Princeton and became a member of the faculty in 1930. An eminent chemist, Professor Allier taught at the university for 42 years. But his classroom was never confined to the campus. Through television and as a guest lecturer, he infected millions of people around the world with his enthusiasm and love for science. His lectures and demonstrations are legendary, and during reunions each year, he repeats the final lecture from Chemistry 104, which always brought his students to their feet. Here are excerpts from that lecture, taped at Louisiana State University. All kinds of fantastic, they don't want to know about all kinds of fantastic things happen in chemistry. That's magic, oh, that's, that's magic. But you know, that isn't nearly as exciting as happened to this paper, turning the black carbon, invisible carbon dioxide, water coming out. That's magic, but this is chemistry. And the fantastic things that happen in chemistry, it's amazing how many things in chemistry were discovered completely by accident. But not only in chemistry, after all, Columbus set out to discover a way to the Indies and discovered our continent. The Fenbire Company to make the aspirin, they had spent 28 million marks, seven million dollars, trying to make a substance called orthophthalic acid, from which they make dyes and drugs and plastics and so on. And after four years of failure, one day a clumsy laboratory boy did something we tell them never to do in a chem lab. He stirred that stuff uh, with, the, uh, with the, uh, a thermometer. <laughs> the thing just turned into the desired orthophthalic acid because the mercury thermometer broke and mercury was the catalyst. And from that minute on, the Fenbier Company used the mercury catalyst process for making their dyes and their drugs. They made three million dollars profit a year with the mercury catalyst process and they raised the kid's salary a dollar a week. <laughs> <laughs> a, uh, an apple dropped off a tree on Sir Isaac Newton's head. Now this happened to many before, but it remained for the prepared mind of Sir Isaac Newton to read into the motion of the apple toward his head, the forces of gravity, and the motion of the planets around the sun. Again and again, we're going to see, as Pastor so aptly said, chance favors only the prepared mind. And I'm going to show you lucky accidents in the field of plastics and in biochemistry and in energy where lucky accidents were responsible for all kinds of fantastic uh, innovation. I want to show you what we do when we have a heavy snowstorm in Princeton. We are lazy. We don't uh, bother to shovel up the snow. We burn it up, you see. Uh, 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 and of course, if you get tired and you don't want to burn it up, uh, well, then you can pick it up, you see. Uh, because I don't want you to be afraid. We're not in any danger at all. scarcer and scarcer in the African jungles. And since you couldn't breed elephants as fast as the Belgian hares, they offered to try anybody in the synthetic billiard ball. And he tried to make them, he made the compressed wood and said, now they draw us the eye. But one day he cut his finger, he went to the same, for this new skin, it was oozing out. And it looks sticky. He said, why can't I take the ground up ivory from the tusk of baby elephants? They had lots of those and cement it together. And it worked fine. Because you see, what he had done, he had discovered Duco cement before the DuPont company had. <laughs> there was only one trouble. I want to turn the light on again because I want to share what happened. There was only one trouble. Uh, when they began to nitrate these things, sometimes they didn't know quite how to nitrate. And they over nitrated. And they get some of those trinitrate. And that was gun and cotton. And the bullion balls were explosive. <laughs> Is working with us, John Wesley Hyatt, one day, mixed that sodas trinitrate with just ordinary household camphor. And a fabulous new product was discovered, celluloid, the first of our plastic. It's very exciting, folks. The same thing turned out now. It's very exciting that the age of plastic began here in the United States. We had 300 years of alchemy in Europe. 
but the age of life. There are 120,000 members of the American Chemical Society. 60% of them do something to, connected with plastics. And that age of plastics, born here in the United States, because John Wesley hired it, cut his finger, and mixed that as a new skin with the <coughs> celluloid. Fabulous beginning, a lucky accident, began a fabulous era. Now the next era, in home, it tells about petroleum. And I'm going to talk about that one. You know, uh, uh, carbon has four bonds about. And these people who know about the organic chemistry and so on, uh, uh, will tell you that carbon has one, two, three, one, four. One, two, three, four. And it has a hydrogen and 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 a hydrogen. There's only one trouble. Uh, we know a compound that has this formula. And people are sort of worried about that because uh, it only has three bonds around it. And then a very clever chemist said, ah, there's a thing called a double bond. They put in a double bond like that. <laughs> double, now, carbon's so stupid and think it has four bonds around. But double bond is very, very reactive. It's, it's unsaturated for you ladies. The food that's in the unsaturates are the ones that have the double bond in it. And they are very reactive. It's like a sailor standing in the street corner. There's a double bond. And what happens when a couple of pretty girls go by? <laughs> I'm going to show you this because I'm going to give you the background of a chemical that was discovered by the DuPont company that has turned out to the tune of over 100,000 pounds a year of plastic, and it was discovered completely by accident. Uh, I'm going to do an experiment to show this first. I'm going to take some bromine, and I'm going to take some, I invented this experiment, so I'm very proud of it. I'm going to take some bacon, and I'm going to keep cook the bacon the way my wife does. Uh, I'm going to burn it. Uh, <laughs> And now, when I take it and I like to heat this bacon, uh, it'll begin to drip. A viewer chemist, it forms a chromium. It forms an unsaturated compound. Uh, and it'll begin to drip. Then I'm going to drop it into there, and the double bond will open up, and the bromine will add on to it, and it'll form a, a colorless. It's going to take about a minute for it to happen. It won't happen instantly. But you'll see a great difference between these are the same color at the minute. It's dropping nicely. I'll drop this in here. I'll probably have to shake it a minute in here. And the bromine gas will go down and add on to that double bond, just as I had shown there. And when I shake it, uh, you'll see it begin to get color. Oh, it's a beautiful experiment. You show your, uh, you, know, you do it with petroleum. If you take petroleum and uh, you know, drop it on hot steel wool, you crack the petroleum the same way you get the double bond. And you can see it's getting uh, fainter. And in about uh, two minutes, this will be absolutely colorless as the bromine has added on to the double bond. And there we have a most unusual compound, bacon. Die bromide. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the story of Teflon. And it happened in, at DuPont Company uh, right before the war. They were working with these fluorinated hydrocarbons. I'm not going to squirt this out, I'll be afraid. Uh, they were working with these hydrocarbons uh, uh, because the, the fluorinated hydrocarbons remain liquid at any temperature. So they use them in a, a fuel lines. Uh, over in Africa, a, a plane might be on the, on the desert at 115 degrees, and uh, 10 minutes later, up in the stratosphere, at 9 to 60 degrees. And if they have oil, the oil would solidify. Uh, and get, get, but the tetrafluoroethylene thing didn't. And they were working with these. And one day, Roy Plunkett, a young fellow just out of the, you can turn that off now if you want. Uh, Roy, uh, Roy Plunkett, uh, just a, a young a fellow, uh, two years out of his PhD with Ohio State. Uh, I've been working all day with this, and an assistant came to me in uh, 1939. This is the discovery of Teflon. And he said, Doc, something very strange happened. He said, I filled this, I, I weighed the tank empty this morning. I filled, I filled it, sorry. Uh, <laughs> So I filled it with uh, a tetrafluoroethylene gas. I use it all day. It's empty tonight, Doc. But you know, Doc, it's heavier tonight empty than it was uh, empty this morning. Well, of course, uh, Roy said the first thing I thought was uh, that he made it the wrong way, but he's a very careful fellow. <coughs> and uh, I said, well, I guess the gas is in there. Uh, the, the valve's just stuck. So he said, we took, and took this off and no gas came out. Then we got a still some wrench, we took this off and no gas came out. Now, <coughs> Prepared mind, because I'm talking about the prepared mind that they discovered. Roy Plunk would have said to him, look, if you don't wait carefully, we're going to fire you. And he threw it away. But he thought, maybe the gas is solidified in there. Just like those liquids solidified there. Maybe the gas is solidified in there. And he took a wire and he stuck it down inside that tank. 
and he drew out of the tanker some of this white, waxy Teflon, the first ever seen by man. He said, we weren't very excited about it because we get dumps like this in the organic chemistry all the time. And it was near closing time, too. But he said, I thought I'd do a, a last experiment before I went home. So I took that Teflon, and I sliced it up, and I boiled it in water, and I boiled it in sulfuric acid, concentrated sulfuric acid, boiled it in sodium hydroxide, boiled it in benzene, boiled it in methyl alpha ketone, nothing happened. Then I got interested. <laughs> Now all these vinyl compounds all go to pieces around 150 to 160 centigrade. But he, uh, Roy said, I heated that in 1939. I heated it to 100, 150, 200, 250, 300, 350, 400. Boy, they knew then to thought we had a fantastic plastic. We patented it right away. We told the customers about it. He says, you know, Doc, uh, it was, his dad, I think, it was packed full of this white thing. He said, you know, Doc, the next week, uh, uh, I got 300 letters for customers asking for samples. And then, by golly, the DuPont company didn't know how to make it. <laughs> <laughs> it took them five years to discover silver as the catalyst. And to this day, they don't know. I saw a letter he wrote to a friend about three years ago in Detroit. He says, two lucky accidents happened that day that gave us that one. First, silver is the catalyst. And accidentally, they must have used a silver gasket in that tank that day. And secondly, the very critical exact amount, 0.001% of oxygen, must be mixed with the dichloroethylene for it to go and not explode when we do it carefully. And it did, and it's Teflon at you, because the accidental discovery and the prepared mind of Roy Plunkett to make that discovery. You've all seen a fusion reaction up there in the sun. That's what keeps the sun up. Every second of your life, 600 million tons of deuterium are reacting to keep the sun hot. And we're trying to duplicate that on Earth. Well, now let me quickly show you something. We're almost done. Show an experiment. Chemical experiments. Well, when we burned, at the very beginning, you know, when we burned that paper, uh, it, it was a chemical reaction. The carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen of the paper began to burn from carbon dioxide. When you burn that wood, because that's all the paper made from uh, carbon dioxide and water. So if, I, well, if I take this piece of paper, a, a, a piece of sugar, and I burn it. <laughs> I get down the side of it. Tomorrow I'm going to beat my wife on me some energy. <laughs> well, I get it. I'll beat in oxygen. It'll burn up the, to uh, the sugar. And I'll beat out carbon dioxide for spiral water. And instead of giving me heat and flame, you have muscular energy and poor life. Well, those are all chemical reactions. Here's another chemical reaction. Uh, a pop out of a hydrogen oxygen uh, And uh, it's a marriage of hydrogen to form water. Da 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 da. I'm not going to have another one like this tonight. My poor wife is ho horrified with this. And we went to high school together that first day. Uh, one of the teachers exploded a bottle of hydrogen and oxygen. And my wife was in the front seat. And it blew my wife right out of chemistry into botany. She never did. <laughs> now I'm going to show you a dust explosion. How a granary explodes. Or how a flower, not only a flower mill blows up, but how a coal mine explodes. It isn't a coal gas exploding. The gas stirs up coal dust and the dust explodes. So I'm going to show you a typical dust explosion. Now, if I take this candle and burn it, it burns very slowly. What could I burn that candle? I'm going to make it burn faster until it's explosion. What could I burn that into to make it burn five times faster? Pure oxygen. But another way to do it is to live it up and burn your candle at both ends. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's going to burn up in half the time, isn't it? Young people, if you burn your candle at both ends, you'll only live half as long. <laughs> but it's more than twice the fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, suppose we take that. Suppose we have a thousand candles. Have here a thousand. You want to turn all the lights out? Now, that would be nice. Now, now, I have a thousand candles here. I'm going to say one, two, three, and now. And it doesn't make a boom. Don't be afraid of that. <laughs> but it will show you what a dust explosion is like. One, two, three. 
continue. All right, turn the lights out now. Uh, Don, now I'm going to do another one. You, Jennifer, you want to pop in the room? Okay, we'll put the top on here. This isn't any challenge at all. <laughs> <laughs> Sixty-five feet high, and I have more hold in the zip. That man, I'm putting a very little bit of this powder, uh, less than a, a tenth of a teaspoonful. And then there is a, 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 a uh, I'm going to bring it out so you can see it. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a spark, so to speak. You know, if you're a chemist and you make a spark uh, in a, a farm and you come out through the roof instead of the door. So I put that there like that, and this is here. In fact, I'll show you. Hey, you want to come on up here? You're going to do this. <laughs> Right up here, yeah. And when I say one, two, three, you're going to squeeze it, see? Good enough. Not that. One, two, three. There we go. Thank you, brother. But now we're going to do it. I'm going to put the top on there. Um, if it comes out and it's toward you, duck so it hits him when you do that. Now, I'm going to do the same. Uh, it, won't, it, won't go too, it won't go too high, actually. Uh, but I'll, I'll see if I can get that up near the ceiling. Uh, I'm going to do the same. And it shows. And, doesn't matter how much stuff I put in there, it's how tightly I put it in. And I'll try to put it in so it'll go up near there without not hitting. Let's see. That ought to go just about to it. One, two. <laughs> you have no idea of the artistry of that. If I put it just a little bit for it, it's going 30 feet high. But I always try to see how close I can come without hitting. Well, now, that's the, that's the chemical reaction. Now we come to the nuclear reaction. That was where a neutron hit uranium. What they did, they tried to smash atoms, you know. They had, they had a big atom, they tried, they tried, and they tried to smash it. They had their own kind of guns. They tried to And then finally they found what they wanted to do was take a, a uranium atom, and they took a uranium atom and smashed it with a neutron, then they could get the fission reaction. You know all this, so I'm going over very quickly. And what they did is if you have this big uranium atom, you see how they like that, you see? And then you shoot a neutron out. May I have that neutron, please? Uh, uh, like the uranium went into two pieces. Iron, cobalt, nickel, oxygen, it, um, it was transmutation. Um, and the interesting, never mind, we'll get it there. Um, um, and the interesting thing is when the neutron hit that, you hit the jackpot, you got three neutrons off for the one that went in. Now this is very important, as we'll see. The fact that one neutron gave you three. We wouldn't have the atom bomb, the nuclear reactor, anything if it weren't for that. But you do see it like transmutation, the uranium changing to two other elements. It's like taking this uh, uh, U.S. water and changing it into French wine, you see. Or taking the French wine and changing it into Russian vodka, you see. Or Russian vodka and changing it into Holland milk, you see. Or Holland milk and changing it into uh, Florida orange juice, you see. <laughs> or Florida orange juice and changing it into Baton Rouge. BAM! <laughs> All these fabulous transmutations, my friend. <laughs> How are you going to get ahead? How are you going to be ready to make discoveries? Three things. Be expert, be human, and have self-confidence. Let's take each of those. Be expert, sure, you're going to take chemistry if you're going to be a chemist. But far more important, take all the mathematics you possibly can. You put it work and say, so, ah, I'm going to biology, I don't need it. You know, the biochemistry, the computer, and some more than any other department. Take all the mathematics you can. Take plenty of English so you can express your discoveries and convince people you know what, what you've discovered. Too many chemical engineers particularly can't write a report for the life of them. They just don't know how to express themselves. Terribly important to learn how to express yourself properly. Um, <clears throat> secondly, be human. The two greatest scientists in our century were Einstein and somebody greater than Einstein. And I'm quoting now about half a dozen Nobel Prize winners sitting around one night and discussing, was there anybody like Leonardo da Vinci Galileo? Niels Bohr was there at the crowd. And they said, Niels would say you're sixth class, fifth class. Heisenberg, Dirac, Schrodinger, uh, Pasavina, who was on the campus here. All these people were around about eight of them that night. And Al Gay was 28th class. And, and I kept my mouth shut and listened to what they were saying. And they said, we think there's nobody fourth class, nobody third class, nobody second class. Einstein, one and a half class. Not quite. 
that equal of somebody, I bet you only 15 people in the room know this man, Max Planck. How many have heard of that? Okay. <laughs> the other thing about the human side is Max Planck in 91 had the Planck constant, which is the basis of all of modern H, basis of all of modern physics. And four years later, a bore, all the Bohr orbits, uh, an electronic orbit, are based on the Planck constant. Uh, uh, four years later, Einstein took the Planck constant, applied it to five fields. Any one of those two would have won the Nobel Prize. And one did. But if he hadn't had a Planck to stand on, he wouldn't have gotten anywhere. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the holy thing is that the year I was in Berlin, every Saturday, Einstein appeared at Planck's house with his wife under one arm and his violin under another. He and Planck sat down and played from three in the afternoon to ten at night with an hour out for dinner. They didn't find that music intruded. It made them dream. And so what I beg of you, yes, be an expert, be human. Do artistic things, painting, <coughs> dancing, drama, music. These things are the things that will make you a great scientist. And finally, self-confidence. And that story, this is the end of the story before I sing. That story is how I first met Einstein. I was working with Fritz Haber in Berlin. And he brought uh, uh, Einstein in to see my a very elaborate apparatus. That was a very long tube, and one of the couple of lenses, and you gave, and you twisted them until the lights were of equal intensity. And then you could read how much oxygen was in this interferometer. And to my horror, Einstein comes, and the rolling end was just a pipe. And he's looking like this, and looking like this. Now, what would most of us have done? We would have been ashamed to show our ignorance, wouldn't we? And walked away and said nothing. But not Einstein. He looks and he says, God, God, look at your hand, I can't see anything. He says, all right, come on, I'm doing this idea. Well, on this idea, professor. Got down, I showed him, he says, Wunderbar. Let me say, I learned that day something terribly important. Never be ashamed to show your ignorance once, rather than remain ignorant all your life. He wasn't afraid, and you don't either. And so, I say that to gain self-confidence, young people, uh, don't be afraid of brave people when you have, have an interview with them. Uh, they're human at that moment. Treat them like human beings. Uh, they have sex drives, they cry, cry, they laugh, they put their pants one leg on a time, they go to the bathroom just like you. <laughs> they are human beings, and if you treat them that way, uh, you'll get understanding them much better. And choose what you're really excited about in life. Be sure you choose what you're very excited about in life. I got the lab at 6, 6.30 in the morning. I'm still working around 10 o'clock. I'm still playing. Uh, and you can do that too. If you choose the right thing, not because it'll give you a lot of money, but because of, you are so excited about what you chose for life and keep on doing it. Well, I'm going to end by singing a song now. This is a song about Yale, Princeton, and Harvard. And those are our, those are our arch enemies, you see. And it goes, the song goes like this. Now, first I'll put something down here and tell you about it. It goes, oh, Yale has always favored the Ohio. That's dark blue, that's Yale, see. And the many sons of Harvard to the crimson rose are true. This is Harvard, you see. Uh, and I'm get, I'll get this ready now. When it comes to the violet, you're going to see something violet here. Some iodine is going to look violet here. And uh, I can't put that here, but this down here. I won't do it yet, but I've got some, some, uh, uh, here, some of this concentrated sulfuric acid here. And when I squirt the water on that, you're going to see, and you see all these little Oh, Yale has always favored the fire that's dark blue, and the many sons of Harvard to the crimson, there's the sons of Harvard, to the crimson rose of true. We are all about, now comes Princeton. And just like you have a tiger here, Princeton is the animal of the tiger, and it's orange and black. We are all the world is wonder, nor on a shall we lie, while the tiger stand defender of the orange and the black. So you can see all these things happen now. I might tell you, I did this reunion down at Princeton, the only old grades come back. And one year, uh, David Furston, my sister Kim Tucky, says something very touching happened. As you began to sing, oh, the Yale has all, he said, an old white head jumped on the back row. Tears began rolling down his cheeks. He said, oh, it was a touching thing. I went back to him and said, I'm a good man. What, you're a Princeton, were you? Oh, he said, I'm not a Princeton man. I'm a musician. <laughs> Thank you.
you worry about this list? This is the end of it. Now, so you get this, this will be the violet from the iodine. Oh, Yale has always favored the pie. Oh, that's dark blue. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's a little peep, but that's what Harvard usually is. <laughs> <laughs> Nor on the shall they lie, while the tiger stands defender of the Argentine.